you got you here, Bob, and I wanted to pivot to you because um, I am really looking forward to what you have to say. Um, by the way, everybody, this is Bob Knackle. He really needs no introduction. He's um, senior head over at JLL. Um, he's got 40 plus years in the business, I believe. He's a commercial legend. And Bob, you are here today and you're going to help us um, help help these agents try to navigate um, this very low volume challenging market. And I have a question here. I got a couple of questions, but I'm going to start out with this question. Pardon me for reading it off my phone. Um, if you can just talk a little bit to these agents in the residential market, what are some practical tips and strategies that you recommend to professionals as they wrap up the year and they prepare for a successful start to 2024? Okay. Well, no, that's a great question. First of all, hello, everybody out there. Um, I want to start with what I usually finish with, um, because I, I caught a few minutes of the last presentation. I know a lot of this, the, the sentiment in the market's not so great and the feeling in the market's not so great um, and the activity has been not so great. But one thing I want you to remember is that the real estate market always has been, is, and always will be cyclical. And it is going to come back. I guarantee you it's going to come back. I don't know when it's going to come back. I think I know, but I, I guarantee you it will. So take heart, do the right things, um, and don't, don't try to cut corners. Realize that this business is a marathon, not a sprint. Uh, if you take care of your clients, especially times like this where things are tough, uh, people will remember that you did the right thing for them when when the chips were down. And it's a great way to to create really strong relationships with people. So, so many different uh, things to talk about, um, you know, what, what to be doing now. Uh, if you follow me on social media, uh, you'll know that I'm a big believer in uh, the fact that uh, although we all spend so much time working in our business, um, trying to make deals, making prospect calls, uh, showing properties, doing all that stuff. We're constantly working in our business. And when you're working in your business, um, it's as if a, a bell rings at nine o'clock in the morning and you get caught up in this whirlwind of activity. Um, and before you know it, the day is over. Uh, what did you accomplish? Where did you get? Before you know it, the week is over. It's Friday night. You look back. What the heck did I achieve this week? Well, in order to uh, to feel like you have a little bit more control and a great thing to do now, even more so when you may have a little bit more time because volume is down, you have to not only work in your business, but you have to work on your business. What do I mean by working on your business? I mean, take some time. The weekend's a great time to do it when you're not bothered, you don't have a bunch of meetings and think about your business from 40,000 feet. Where do you want to be in a year? Where do you want to be in three years? Where do you want to be in five years? Uh, what are the things that worked well for you last year? What didn't work so well? What did you wish you did a little more of? What should you have done a little less of? What should you have said yes to? What are the things particularly you should have said no to? Uh, you know, our time and our knowledge are our two biggest assets as brokers. You're always going to be increasing your knowledge base. You can't get more time. So you have to use it as effectively and efficiently as you can. But take the time to work on your business. Come up with the strategies that you need to implement in order to get where you ultimately want to get to. What are your long-term, your, your short-term, medium-term, and long-term objectives? What do you need to do to get there? Um, who do you need to help you get there? Um, and, um, and then devise tactics to implement those strategies and achieve those, those strategic objectives. So take the time to figure it out. It's amazing to me how many people don't do that. But sit on a Saturday, go to the park, go sit somewhere by yourself and write down, where, where do I want to be? I, you know, do I want to keep selling the same type of stuff I'm selling? Do I want to sell bigger stuff? Do I want to sell newer stuff? Do I want to sell stuff in a different area? What, what is it that I want to become known for? And I, I tell people that from a brokerage perspective, if you really want to get to the very, very top of this business, there are three attributes that I see that folks have that um, increase the probability that you're going to do really, really well. Number one is you have to be an expert at something. You know, if you say, hey, I sell residential in New York City. Well, 
there's 3.3 million dwelling units in New York. How could you be an expert at 3.3 million dwelling units? You can't. So the, the idea behind, behind being an expert is to pick a, a narrowly defined area in which you can be better than anyone else. Uh, read Jim Collins' book, Good to Great. What Collins says is the difference between great companies and good companies is the great companies pick something that they think they can do better than anybody else in the world. And everything they do is centered on achieving that objective. Every decision they make, they say, well, what is that going to help us get to where we want to get to? And in the same way, uh, you want to be an expert, become known for something. Uh, and so pick an area that you can become a true expert in that should be small enough that you really can grasp every single as aspect of it, but large enough that you can make a great living doing it. Uh, that's number one. Be an expert, be a specialist. But being a specialist is the easiest way to differentiate yourself from the thousands of other people trying to do what you do. Uh, and that differentiation creates a competitive advantage. Number two, passion. Are you passionate about this? Do you love it? Because no matter how good you are, you're going to run into tough times. And it's that passion that will let you break through those tough times, keep going, and ultimately succeed. And then lastly, discipline. Do you have the discipline to do what it takes? A lot of what we do is not glamorous, right? You have to make your cold calls, send out your email blast, send out your text, write content, make hard mail. Do your networking, all this stuff. Networking's fun. The other stuff is not so much fun, but you have to do it. And to do it day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, because it's the collective mosaic of doing all these things at, uh, over and over and over again that is what gets results for you. And, you know, Abraham Lincoln once famously said that uh, discipline is choosing between what you want now and what you want most. So think about what you want most and do the things you need to do to achieve it. So I, that was a lot encapsulated in there. Bob, but you asked the question, so I had to answer it. You, you, you ooze wisdom. And you know, it just comes out so fluently. I mean, it, it's so many great points. Um, may I, I, I think John has a question, but I want to just follow up with one question to you. Um, how important was learning from mistakes to you? I mean, were you the kind of guy that would fail in something and just kind of move on? Or, oh, or were look, you if, if you're not failing, you're not pushing yourself hard enough. Um, unfortunately, I think Paul and I made way too many mistakes. Uh, and that was the result of not seeking out uh, more experienced folks and asking them questions. I think if you, if you ask people who have a lot of experience in the in the business, you'd be surprised how many are willing to share with you. Uh, had we done that, we probably would have avoided making hundreds of the mistakes that we made. Fortunately, we didn't make a lot of those mistakes twice. Um, but the fact is, we made a lot of mistakes, learn from them. And you want to make some mistakes, no matter what. Uh, you want to make mistakes, because that means you're really pushing yourself. Uh, and you want to do that. But, you know, in later years, uh, we formed an advisory board, uh, very senior people in the industry. They gave us great advice. Um, I recommend young people do that. Talk to older people, take somebody out for a cup of coffee, have lunch with them, just uh, corner them for 15 minutes at a networking event and ask them questions. Uh, it's great, a great thing to do. I don't know if you recall, Bob, but I took you out for drinks in 2009. Um and you were so gracious because I didn't really establish myself yet. Um, and you sat down with me and you spent two hours with me. And I I was really just an agent trying to start this Urban Digs. And I learned a ton from that. So I just want to say that what you're saying right now, you physically did that um, 14 years ago with me when I was when I was trying to learn. So thank you for that. Well, and, thanks, um, thanks for remembering. I, I, <laughs> I remember that, but that's that's great. That's okay. It's a long time ago. <laughs> no, look, I think a lot of that stems from from a couple of things. People say, "Hey, Bob, why do you why do you write the stuff you write? Why do you post the stuff online that you you basically you could be helping somebody that's competing with you?" And I say that there's two mindsets that folks can have. Right? One is that life is a zero sum game, and every win for you is a loss for me. Uh, I think those people are patently unhappy. Uh, and probably don't have as enriched a life as they could have. 
or you could have an abundance mentality. I mean, look at the the sales market in in New York, and just from a commercial investment property perspective, there's 165,000 investment properties in the four boroughs, not including Staten Island. If that's not enough to go around for everybody, I don't know what is. Right. So, I mean, if you're if you're willing to share, um, you know, and especially in the investment sales world, uh, I am really, really good friends with a lot of the folks who people would consider my competitors. Um, but we share information all the time, love seeing each other uh, get together. And th there is enough to go around. We can learn from each other. We can share information. Uh, you become a better professional when you get along with other folks than if you're you're just operating in a, a myopic world where you it's it's you against the world. And in the residential world, there's even more. I said there's 165,000 investment properties. I, I wonder how many apartments there are if you're in the residential space. Probably a lot more than that. So um, certainly there's enough to go around for everybody. Yeah, and I think it's amazing that you've you've personally transacted every single possible investment property in New York City. That's that's really one for the record. <laughs> well, John, I, from your <laughs> lips, right? No, I right. <laughs> last week but, I closed deal two thousand uh, three hundred and twenty one. So uh, I mean, it's, there. not quite. Everyone. It's like you you look at the New York skylines like ah, that one's Bob, that one's Bob. I mean, it's, it's just it's pretty amazing. But I wanted to dig into what. To go back to one of your earlier comments and that that marathon mentality, right? Because you, you do have to be running a marathon in order to kind of keep up with the highs and lows of the real estate cycle because it is cyclical. And I'm curious, what are some of your, I mean, if you would like to share some of your personal strategies for managing that stress and maintaining a positive mindset when you're facing that that runner's wall that marathoners face? Yeah, well, John, it's a great question. And I think part of having the ability to kind of uh, remain calm or stay focused during uh, that is to understand what the probability of success is. What, is, what does success look like? Uh, you have to define that for yourself, but what's the probability of success? So as an example, uh, in Manhattan, which is where I do most of my business, south of 96th on the east side and 110 on the west side, there's 27,649 buildings. Uh, of that total stock in the average year, 2.6% of them trade, which is 719 properties. I know that about half the stuff that goes on the market actually sells. So let's say 5% of the, the stock is on the market at any one time. That tells you if you call 20 owners, 19 of them are going to say no to you. You have to be okay with that. If you're making cold calls and you get the phone slammed on you 19 times in a row, most people who are not in the right mindset are going to feel terrible. Oh, I'm getting my head kicked in. This is really bad. The person who understands the probability will say, this is great. You know what the probability the next one's going to say yes is? <laughs> and that's kind of the mentality you have to have. You have to realize it's a numbers game. It's a probability business. You have to know what your, your hit ratio is. You know, we, we call uh, the batting average uh, you know, how many of every pitch you give, how many do you win, your slugging percentage of how many listings you get, how many do you close. Uh, so you need to to look at the, the business very anal analytically and understand what your probability of success is, uh, understand what success looks like for you, uh, and then just kind of keep, you know, track everything that you do. I still, yep. to this day, you know, I'm, I'm about as analog a guy as there is. Uh, I write down uh, every day I have my my line pad and, you know, my. Uh, yeah, exactly. What do they call it? The uh, this yeah. is my uh, text <laughs> stack, right. That's my text stack where I write my my calls down. But, you know, I know last year uh, on average, my goal was to talk to 100 property owners a week. I talked to on average 114 a week. This year, I'm tracking through the third quarter. I was about 103, 104. I probably will end up somewhere around that for the year. But understand, you know, what, what your metrics are. And that helps you have a little better handle on, on planning and forecasting um, what you need to do to achieve. You know, we all talk about, well, next year, I'd like to make X dollars. But how do you get there? You can go backwards. If you know what your success ratio on listings is, you know what your average listing price is, your average commission rate is, how many pitches you have to give to get a listing, how many calls you have to make to get a pitch. You know, you can basically back into how many calls you have to make. And then you can back into how many hours you have to work. 
uh, when you have to go to sleep so you can get up in time to do it. It's it just like a bunch of dominoes, but you have to be very analytical about your business, what you're doing, why you're doing it and, and that kind of thing. But that kind of gives you comfort. So even when things might not be going so well, you know, if I know, hey, I, I connected with 102 property owners this week, zero happened for me. Um, but I still feel pretty good about it because you know what? Odds are next week's going to be a much better week because I know I did what I needed to do this week. Yeah. You know what? A lot of agents yeah. would, would A, not have the passion to do this, not have the um, the motivation and the discipline to do this. You already spoke, spoke about all those formulas, uh, elements of the formula that need to happen. And, um, you know, I got to tell you, it's just really comforting to see. Um, I don't know how you get the energy for this and you're just still doing it <laughs> and you're still doing it and you're still doing it. And you're, and again, you said a hundred and X calls and, and none of them produced a deal. That's okay. The, it's a numbers game. I'll think you got that thick skin. Um, I got a question for you guys, you know, put your questions in the chat. I already see two questions, uh, in the chat, uh, for Bob, put more questions in. We got them for about five or 10 more minutes. I got one question here. If you guys have a question, put it in the chat. We will get to it. But, um, Bob, I want to ask you. Um, in this in this difficult, challenging market where where the gap between bid ask is widening, and it's getting tougher and tougher to close these deals, how can real estate professionals foster and strengthen their client relationships um, during this type of environment with scarce transaction? Um, are there any ways uh, to provide value and support to clients beyond the traditional buying and selling? Yeah, no, I I think that the principles behind that are the same whether the market is good, bad, ugly, whatever it is, it's it's all the same. And I say you you rarely make mistakes if you treat your clients like they were a family member. You know, if the if the owner or the client was your mom or your dad, what advice would you give them? And if you take that perspective, you're not going to give bad advice. Lately, you know, for the past year, year and a half, I've been telling people not to sell. I, I start every pitch with saying, hey, look, we, we looked at your property. We analyzed it. We're prepared to tell you what the value is. We know you're going to be disappointed in what the value is, but we're telling you, you should not sell now. Conditions are not great. Interest rates are high. Equity is very, very conservative today. It's These are not ideal conditions. Now, maybe that seller has to sell. Uh, you know, we love the old reliable death, divorce, taxes, partnership disputes. Um, and maybe some people have very compelling strategic reasons for wanting to sell now. Um, and we'd like to understand what those are uh, if a client says, I do want to sell now regardless. But if someone's really a truly discretionary seller, um, we we say, you know, don't sell today. Give Give people the advice that you think is right. So in every situation is different. Understand the best thing to do, if you want to provide service or the best service to your client, number one, listen to them intently. Ask a ton of questions. How long have you owned the property? What do you like about owning it? What, what don't you like about owning it? What, what's, what are your plans for the future? If you sell, would you 1031? Would you just pay the taxes, put the money in the bank? Would you buy a big boat? <laughs> Why are you selling? You know, I have some clients say to me, look, Bob, I'm 92. I, I, yeah, I should wait three years, but I might be dead in three years. Sell the building. I want to take, you know, enjoy the money. There's a number of reasons. You have to ask a lot of probing questions to understand what's driving someone. Um, and if they're sufficiently motivated, those are folks that you want to be working for. Uh, you don't want to be working for, for someone who says, well, if I get 20% more than my property's worth, I'm happy to sell it because they're not going to transact, especially in a market like this. You know, and now, you know, we have a situation where the Fed has telegraphed, you know, for, for a long time, rates have been going up. Now the Fed's telegraphing rates are coming down. So what is that doing? It's having a two-pronged effect on people in the investment sales world. Number one, most of the uber wealthy people that I've been speaking to for the past year, year and a half, have said to me, yeah, Bob, that, that sounds like a really great deal, but you know what? It'll be cheaper in three months. I'm going to wait. Okay, that no longer holds. I don't think many people think it'll be cheaper in three months. Um, so those folks are now off the sidelines and wanting to buy. The problem is that a lot of sellers are saying, oh, rates are coming down now. Well, I'm not going to sell at today's price because tomorrow the value is going to go up because rates are going to come down. So you have these counterbalancing 
influences. And some people, notwithstanding the fact that rates are coming down, some people don't believe they're going to fall very much and they are transacting today. Other people think that they're going to fall tremendously and so they're holding. Um, so it, everyone has a different perspective. But as a broker, the only way you know who you should be spending time with, who you should be focused on, is to ask those questions and figure out what's in the head of the person that you you want to bring on as a client. Is it worth working for them? Is it not? You don't want to find it if you've marketed a property for three, four, five months that they say, oh, well, you know, if I can't get this uh, above market price, I'm just not going to transact. That's not the time to find out. You want to find out before you do anything with regard to proactive marketing. Awesome stuff. Hey, Bob, I want to dig into some of the, the questions we've got uh, from the audience here. Uh, and there's one from Maurice, and he asks, you know, going back to, you know, your your three your three prongs, right? Be an expert, be, you know, be passionate, be disciplined. On the expert side, uh, by specializing, do we pigeonhole ourselves to that specific product price point, et cetera? If we become, for example, the Tribeca Loft Broker, do our clients who own Park Avenue co-ops look elsewhere? I wonder if you could speak to that. Yeah. And you know what, John, you can't be all things to all people. If you want to be a true expert, um, you have to commit yourself to something. Um, jacks of all trade are master of none. Um, and if you really, really want to be an expert, if you want to be the person, you know, we, we talk about in the brokerage world, we talk about being top of mind, right? So if you, if you use the example I mentioned before of Manhattan, where the turnover ratio is 2.6% of the stock, what that tells you is when someone buys a property in Manhattan, they own it on average for 40 years before they sell it. So people are not always transacting. Most of the time you call people, they're going to say, no, I don't want to sell. So how do you stay top of mind with people? You do all of your market presence stuff. You make your calls, do your email blasts, uh, do your text messages, do your hard mail, speak in public, produce content, send them information, send the market reports, demonstrate that you are the expert in that area. And if you do that effectively, then the minute that it comes into their head, hey, I have to sell because of X, Y, or Z, you want the next thing they think, oh, I have to call that person because I know that person can help me better than anyone. And you just, yes, you're going to lose some opportunities. And it's interesting. I had a young guy was was talking to the other day and he's like, you know, Bob, I, this isn't what I focus on, but I could make money doing this. And I said, yeah, you could make money selling cocaine on the corner too, but is that what you want to be doing? There's a lot of ways to make money. But if you if you do one thing and focus on that one thing, then you are creating time as, as valuable as time is. Think about this example. So let's say last week I sold an office building, a retail property, and an apartment building. And this week I'm pitching an apartment building. Well, the owner of the apartment building I'm pitching this week wants to hear everything about the apartment building I sold last week. Couldn't care less about the office building and the retail property I sold. So two thirds of my time was wasted from this owner's perspective. Had I sold three apartment buildings last week, every single minute I spent working is accretive towards helping me get this week's assignment. That's how you create time. That's how you leverage your time. And being that expert puts you in a position to do things much more effectively and efficiently. And yes, you are losing some opportunities by not doing that. But again, you can't be all things to all people. I can't tell you how many clients I've had that have said to me, Bob, you know, I see the way you market properties and the prices you get are astonishing. I'm never, ever going to buy a property from you. But if I ever sell, you'll be my first call. And I'm totally comfortable with that position because you can't be all things to all people. I love it. Um, Bob, we're in Q&A time. I got a couple of uh, questions here. If you guys have any other questions for Bob, the Q&A is open. Um, Esther Muller, we love Esther Muller. Uh, industry le legend in her own right. Um, she's always learning from you after selling your great company for a hundred trillion dollars. You know, Esther. I wish, <laughs> I, Esther, I wish it was a hundred trillion. <laughs> but we, 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 I should have had you as my advisor when we were selling. <laughs> that, that works. Uh, what motivates you since money is no longer the mission? Uh, what drives you, Esther Muller, in love with Bob? Yeah, Esther, I, I love you too. Thank you so much. And I, I, I haven't seen you in a while. I can't wait to see you again. 
Um, but I will tell you that, um, you know, after the sale of the company, it was a, a little bit of an introspective time for me. Um, you know, what did I want to do? Did I want to buy property? Do I want to go to the Cayman Islands, sit on Seven Mile Beach for the rest of my life? Um, I thought about all kinds of things. And what occurred to me is I really love being a salesman. Um, I love selling properties. And uh, the, the thing I, I think what it is, is that I I realized that I'm addicted to winning. And, and you know, everybody today talks about um, about this dopamine rush that you get from things that make you happy. Well, if you think about the brokerage business, right, you you get that win or you get that dopamine rush when you find out somebody wants to sell their property. Uh, and then you get it when you you do the pitch and you find out you won the business. And then you get it when you sign the contract and then you get it when you close the deal. So I, th I just think this is the greatest business in the world. And people ask me why I still do it, because to me, it's a career and it's a hobby also. So, you know, I, I when I'm not working, I love to uh, spend time with my wife and my my daughter who's 15. Uh, but if they were going away for the weekend uh, on a weekend girls trip, what would I do? I'd, I'd just work all weekend because I just love doing it. And, I, you know, I think that in some ways, given how technology is changing the world today, um, that uh, I'm kind of like starting over. Um, you know, when, when I sat at my desk in 1984, I had no computer, no fax machine, no cell phone. And as much as the world has changed over the past 40 years, I think the extent to which the world is going to change over the next five is even more dramatic based on AI. Um, so I, I feel like I'm kind of starting over. I'm lucky I have a 40 year track record behind me, but I, you know, I want to take advantage of these AI tools uh, learn new things, be able to deliver services to clients in new ways. Uh, and to me, it's just great. And I think this is the greatest business in the world. Why would I want to do anything else? And, you know, I always tell people I will never retire. Uh, I talk for a living. I'm not doing manual labor. So, you know, it's relatively easy. And, you know, I, I tell my wife all the time when they put me in the ground, I'll have deals under contract. You'll have to go collect the commissions. <laughs> and and that's OK. That's that's my life. Well, that's what they say. You know, if you do what you love, you'll never work a day in your life. But just to keep this, you know, keep this flowing, there are some people, there are some things that people don't love, and that is a cold call. And that's sort of the, the subject of the next question uh, from Adam. He says, I'm a heavy believer in the multiple touch point model. I think agents fear the dreaded call for the sake of a call. For new agents, how do you suggest creating content that always feel feels fresh so calling doesn't feel so fake? Yeah, well, I, I think the the secret of cold calling is to always uh, call and offer something of value. Best thing you can offer of value is proprietary information. Um, think about it. You, you know, two two resi brokers call up the owner of uh, of an apartment, and one says, "You know, hey, I, I sell a lot of apartments. You want to sell? Um, you know, I have a lot of buyers looking in the market today." Or somebody calls and says, "Hey." Just want to let you know, I, I see you have a beautiful three bedroom, three bath. We just did a study of every three bedroom, three bath apartment that sold in the last two years within 10 blocks of your building. And do you know what? The average price was X and the average price per foot was Y. And all of a sudden I'm like, wow, this person really is, knows what they're talking about. I'm going to want to talk to that person. Uh, so create something of value, proprietary data is the most valuable thing there is. First of all, if you're in the real estate business, you're not in the real estate business. You're in the information business. And if you're relying on third-party information, you know, somebody's cat could get access to, to uh, publicly available information. Create a data set that's your own, that's unique, that people are going to want to hear about. Most, most people who own real estate it's a major asset of theirs. If there's something that's going to impact the value, either positively or negatively, they want to know about that. So create something of value that you can engage with somebody and create a reason for them to want to talk to you. It's yeah. that's that's the easiest way to do it. And when when you're making those calls and all of a sudden you're getting positive feedback and they say, hey, Sally, hey, Fred, that's great. I never heard anybody tell me that before. I'm really impressed by that. You're going to you're going to not you can't wait to get to the next phone call and talk to the next owner.
Yeah, it's going to be like a light bulb kind of a thing going off right over there, right? And I mean, look, messaging is tough. It is tough. I, I think a lot of agents are not experts in messaging. We certainly are not experts in messaging, but you said something. I mean, we built a business out of information, right? And I talk to agents. I'm still trying to understand uh, how to increase my business. My business is getting agents to subscribe to my stuff. And when I talk to my core, you know what they tell me? Noah, you give me the grenade and the bazooka and the Uzi in my arsenal so that I can turn data into dollars. So they're taking you the- could even, You could even, somebody could take your data set and take a microcosm of the data set and dice and slice it in a way that makes it unique to them, that they can tell a story. They can, they can give value to a client, unlike someone else who, who may have access to the data, but didn't interpret it the way they interpreted it. Yeah, and it's hard. And I think a lot of agents are hesitant to do it because they're not they're not into design and framing and messaging and MailChimp and setting up and templates and all that. And guys, there's help. I mean, John and I, we do this as well for agents. There are workshops on this talking about how to do it. So you just find them. They're on our site too, free for our users to go check it out. And you can go do this, take that information and for very cheap money, set all this up. Yeah, I, I love think that. if I'm an agent and I feel like, hey, I'm, I, I don't really have direction or I, I don't have that value proposition to offer to people, I would get in your office, sit down with you guys and go through, hey, I, I sell this type of, of property in this area. Let's look at the data. What story can you tell? You could take a data set and you can craft dozens and dozens of stories out of the same data set. It all depends what you want to present and how you want to present it. Yeah, I love it. All right. I got one more question, Bob. Um, if you guys have any final questions for him, this is the last call. We got to let him go. We don't have him forever, but we do have one here that I wanted to ask you. Um, Bob, do you see some negative impacts for the economy as a whole or regional New York City from the coming CRE refi cliff? Yeah, that that's probably the biggest, um, uh, the biggest landmine in the market today uh, is really what happens when an owner has to refi. You know, we were lulled into a very artificial world with interest rates being so low for so long. Um, you know, it, it, uh, Fed Chair Greenspan uh, said that the housing crisis back in 06, 07 was caused by rates being too low for too long. Well, they were a lot lower and a lot lo lower, a lot longer uh, during this past period. And so if you have a three and a half percent mortgage that is maturing next month, um, you know, you're looking at, you know, probably a rate that's going to be about double that, uh, a little more, a little less, maybe depending on product type. Um, that is a, that's a big problem. Uh, and I think that if you look at, uh, what's happened, the Fed has tried to, um, it tried to kind of calm inflation, uh, and, uh, and, uh, temper things a little bit within the broader economy with their big rate increases, uh, the problem is only about 20% of the U.S. economy is directly tied, its performance is directly tied to interest rates. Unfortunately, real estate is one of those. Uh, and so we were disproportionately negatively impacted by the rate increases. But, you know, 35% of our economy is government and healthcare. And, and I don't know anybody that said, oh, I'm going to I'm going to put my open heart surgery off until rates come down. So, you know, people go ahead and have to do stuff. Uh, but, you know, the broader economy, not so bad, maybe slowing a little bit, but broader economy is good. I think in New York, anyway, I think the thing that has the biggest impact on um, on the real estate market actually is public policy. Uh, I think our, our elected officials um, are implementing some policy that's really having a very negative impact on the real estate market. And, uh, you know, that that's more of a concern than anything else. Awesome. Uh, seller financing, creative financing, is that going on right now or no? Yeah, it's being, it certainly would help if you want to get uh, get a better price as a seller offering seller financing or uh, a small piece of secondary financing can help you get a better price. Uh, but anytime the market is uh, in a downward motion, I should say there, there is there's plenty of liquidity out there. Uh, it's just very, very expensive. Um, so it's not like in, nobody can get a mortgage. You can get a mortgage very easily. It's just really, really expensive. Um, right. But if a seller is willing to offer financing at a more reasonable rate, that certainly can translate into a higher price for them. 
I love it. Awesome stuff. Um, yeah, we, we are done, Bob. Thank you. That was just a wealth of information. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. I'm sure our users here, thank you as well for your time. And um, hopefully you can, you guys could just implement some of these methods and these formulas and these strategies to to increase your business a little bit. And guys, um, don't, don't be shy to email Bob. All right, Bob Knackle is over at JLL, Senior Managing Head over there and say thank you and introduce yourself. Maybe you'll do a deal with him one day. Maybe he'll help you one day. Okay. Yeah, um, please feel free to email me at bob.knackle at jll.com. Uh, happy to answer questions or you know, I produce a lot of uh, materials that I'm happy to share with folks. So, um, and also if you're a residential broker and you, uh, you know of a commercial property that's not in your wheelhouse to sell, I'm um, happy to pay referral fees to brokers who uh, give us information on stuff that's for sale. I have a lot of residential brokers that uh, I do that with. So if you'd like to refer that to us and uh, make a, a big chunk of the fee for giving me a name and a phone number, happy to do that as well. I love it. This is what it's about, guys. Um, Bob Knackle, thank you so much for your time and staying a little thank extra. You. I really, really appreciate it. You are a legend. You are a class act. That is Bob Knackle. Uh, Senior Managing Head over at JLL. That is John Walkup. I am Noah Rosenblatt. This has been um, a webinar discussing 2024 strategies to deploy and the year in review. I hope you guys liked it. We will catch you guys next time. Cheers, everybody. Thank you, Bob. Take care. Thank everybody. you very much. Thanks, Happy holidays. Thanks, Noah. Happy Thank holidays. You. Take care. Bye.